As we head into the first ever Las Vegas Grand Prix, with all of the controversy and skepticism about what the race is going to be like and what it says about the current state of Formula 1, it must be remembered that this isn't the first time that F1 has raced in Las Vegas. In the early 80s and at the beginning of the digital age, the sport was growing rapidly. As television became more and more ubiquitous, it meant the coverage of the sport was reaching more and more people, sponsors were willing to pay more and more money, and it also meant the television rights to actually show the Grand Prix were also generating more and more money. This financial snowball meant that Formula 1 was trying to break into new markets all the time, and given that Las Vegas and their casinos were promoting sporting events like golf and boxing with great success, a certain man in Formula 1 saw that as an opportunity to bring Formula 1 to Las Vegas to take advantage of the promoting and financial power that Vegas had. That man was Bernie Eccleston. Before the now convicted fraudster was hiding £400 million in Singapore bank accounts from the United Kingdom, in the late 70s and early 80s he was making his money as the ringmaster of Formula 1. Bernie was in charge of FOCA, which was the Formula 1 Constructors Association. To make a long political story short, FOCA was given the right to negotiate and secure the TV rights, which gave 47% of the TV revenue to the teams, 30% to the FIA, and 23% to the company that promoted F1 races, which also happened to be owned by Bernie. It was through his connections with the casinos and the enticing prospect of combining the biggest motorsport in the world with the biggest sporting promotional city in America that finally landed Formula 1 in Sin City. Unlike with the 2023 Grand Prix, there wasn't as much motivation from the government and other local businesses to make the race go through the heart of Las Vegas. The race only happened because of the Caesars Palace Casino, but it also meant that the race could only be hosted in a place that they actually owned. The Caesars Palace Grand Prix, named so for commercial reasons to help promote the hotel and casino, was a bizarre race from the very beginning. Starting with the fact that in trying to actually find a place to build a track, the organisers landed on their own car park. From helicopter shots, the 2.6 mile circuit with 14 corners which in 1981 cost 7 million dollars to build, not only looked boring on paper but it just didn't evoke any sense of excitement from the fans or the drivers being that it was dropped on top of a car park with concrete barriers lining the track. The sunny harbour of Monaco or the natural forests of Spa, this was not. And now, there were many oddities with the track, too many to actually name in just this one video, but a pretty crucial one is that unlike most of the other tracks on the calendar, it ran anti-clockwise. And now, this turned out to be a nightmare for the drivers because their necks just weren't used to experiencing the g-force around an anti-clockwise circuit. Multiple drivers suffered from neck pain and some teams even had to install braces and brackets in the cockpit so that the drivers during the race could rest their helmets on them through a corner and ease some of the pressure. Combine that with the Nevada desert heat which on race day reached over 35C or almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it's no surprise that the track was a massive physical challenge which caused some drivers to even vomit during the race. And now, in the interest of fairness, the drivers did praise the quality of the tarmac saying that it was quite grippy, Oh, and it also had its own sphere, so I guess some things never change. However, in terms of the track itself, not only was the layout horrendously boring, but from a driving perspective, McLaren driver John Watson summarised it best, saying, You had this totally flat ground and three for high concrete barriers, so you had very little sense of reference points. A driver needs reference points around the racetrack like a building or a tree to help you find the rhythm of the circuit. It was probably the least appealing Grand Prix circuit I think I've raced on. To give F1's big debut in Vegas every last advantage to succeed, F1 also made the Caesars Palace Grand Prix the last race of the season in both 81 and 82. And during both seasons, all of the titles were settled in the final race in Vegas, with Nelson Piquet winning the first of his three titles in 1981 and Keke Rosberg winning the championship in 1982. Something that's often overlooked however is the actual Grand Prix itself, and so just to show you how thorough my videos are, 
I decided to save you the pain and watch them both back for myself so you don't have to. And now, if I'm being totally honest, starting in 1981, it definitely wasn't the worst race that I've ever seen. I mean, despite the fact that I knew the outcome going in, the fact that it was a title decider between three different drivers already made it exciting in one sense. And actually throughout the race, each of the three title protagonists at different points were all in a position to mathematically win the title. Having said that, the thing that made it awful was firstly, some of the worst camera placement and TV direction that I have ever seen in my life watching Formula 1, and worse than anything else, the drab look of the circuit which just puts you in this concrete trance as you're watching. It's something that I would have never thought about and that you'd never even notice if you just watched the highlights, but when you watch 75 laps of the same boring concrete circuit, somehow it actually makes your perception of the race even worse. In the end, Alan Jones in the Williams, who took the lead after starting from second, basically walked away up at the front winning by over 20 seconds. And the only real highlights were a very scary crash for Patrick Tambe, who stunningly walked away with only minor injuries, and a decent enough fight between title rivals PK and Reutemann. When it comes to the last race to be hosted in Las Vegas in 1982, straight away the placement of the cameras and TV direction were noticeably a lot better, but the race was definitely worse. The only highlight was a mega wheel to wheel scrap between Nicky Lauda and Andrea de Cesarez, but other than that, it was once again another concrete nightmare of forgetfulness. Strangely, having watched both of the races back, I knew straight away from a first person point of view why this race failed. It had no soul. The track was awful, the backdrop was a car park, and you just get the sense that because the race was hosted for all of the wrong reasons, that manifested in the product that we got. And now, I am not going to sit here and tell you that hosting a race for money is entirely bad. Formula 1 is a business that has to make money, motorsport has always been expensive, and the word Grand Prix literally means grand prize. It's not wrong for money to be the motivation, but it's wrong for it to be the only motivation at the cost of neglecting everything else. In the end, despite the races being okay at best, the entire event turned out to be nothing but a colossal losing proposition. The Caesars Palace Grand Prix didn't generate the crowd it needed to, it didn't generate the sponsors it wanted to, and the TV viewership was also disappointing. Despite still having a few more years left on the contract, that was that for Formula 1 and Las Vegas. Bizarrely, after Formula 1 left, IndyCar took it over for a couple of years, turning the track into a kind of sort of oval but also not really. But to no one's surprise, that race also didn't last that long, and after a couple of years, circuit racing left Las Vegas for good, and the ground on which the track was built on was used for a shopping mall. Because this is America, so what else was it going to be used for? Ironically, F1 ran from Las Vegas like a bad bachelor party that didn't last very long, but still lasted long enough to make everyone involved want to forget about it. After 41 years, Formula 1 returns to the scene of one of its most ambitious and bizarre races, hoping to recapture and capitalize on the potential it feels Las Vegas still has in the modern era. Regardless of what happens in the 2023 Las Vegas Grand Prix, and if it'll be as bad as everyone thinks it's going to be, it's going to take some beating to be worse than the original F1 race in Vegas. The question is, will Las Vegas deliver what F1 will be hoping for, or are they just destined to repeat history all over again? Well, there you have it. If you did enjoy this video and want to support the channel, then don't forget to subscribe. That would be massively appreciated, and I'll see you in the next one.